Hey there, everybody. This is Charlie Man ninety three. No, this is not in any way affiliated with Playlist or oh my Playlist or Play Asia. I messed that one up really badly. But we have an actual affiliate right here. You can help with his videos. Go ahead, Lewis. <laughs> do I have to do it? Is, if it, you want is to. it required? You don't have to, mate. It's up to you. <laughs> I would just like to remind everyone that should you actually follow my affiliate links, that for uh, I have a rule, and that's whites only. If you want to be, uh, <laughs> it's also a rule for this stream: it's whites only. If if you are uh, some sort of quad rune like Sargon of Akkad, you are not welcome on the stream. Or, or are I'm you? A quad rune. <laughs> <laughs> my bad, bro. <laughs> I did tell you I was. <laughs> you did? I don't. I guess. I didn't say actually what the number was, but yeah, I am mixed race. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we gotta. Well, that's the problem with these streams. You gotta keep the. Uh, well, I mean, well, you're part frog. You're part Pepe. So. <laughs> oh yeah, that's 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 partially true. It's it's French Canadian, so it's kind of like the bastardized French. Did you get my tweet? Did you get my tweet <laughs> with the Pepe? Oh. <laughs> uh, French Canadian Pepe. Possibly. Yeah. Did you get it? When when did you send uh, it? That's, Right when you said that stream on the stream that you're part French Canadian. Oh, probably I just, then. I, I was getting I was getting spammed with shit when I was on that stream. Oh, oh, I th damn it! I thought I was first. <laughs> anyway, no. people. <laughs> anyway, today is me and Lewis's first ever like live stream together. I'm pretty sure. Yep. Well, I actually have live streamed with Sargon before, but briefly. Oh, actually, no. First time. I had a really bad moment where I had to be quiet to talk to him and I just couldn't get, I just couldn't say right. anything because it was, and then the second time it was a drama buddy stream with a, a person that I just recently responded to, Johnny Fox, and I couldn't say a word. <laughs> he was <laughs> arguing with someone called John Kelly. Do you remember him from Gamergate? Oh yeah, faintly. Yeah. I was on that stream and I was like, I'm just going to laugh. <laughs> I mean, it was that's weird that was weird and he also commented on a few of my videos as well but he seems to have forgotten largely <laughs> do you yeah. remember the you you actually commented on this video it was the first time you ever did it it was the varilo thing i was when you did the impression i don't know if you remember uh... that it was uh, you might not remember it but i did like an impression of him and john kelly being essentially gay lovers <laughs> <laughs> no i don't that was remember one, it, it's, yeah, you commented so on it. Though. Yeah, it was. Even I don't remember what I said, but um, I remember who I parodied though. And then, yeah, the, and then you you saw another one recently, but I can't remember what that was. But yeah, so I mean, anyway, it's about you, you and me. <laughs> yeah. So what I want to know is, and this is um, some I've always I've always wondered, what got you into Filthy Frank? Because I wanted to ask you this for ages. Um, I don't even know. I just, I, I just remember uh, somebody on Twitter mentioned him by name, and then I looked into him, and I watched actually, I watched an older video of his on when he was actually on his prior channel, and I actually didn't like it, um, because I think it's, it's hard to just acclimatize to his kind of humor immediately, um, and then afterwards, when he started the new channel, I remember watching one of the videos, and I think it was his video on Weeaboo's. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember watching, and I was sort of cracking up so hard, and I was like, man, this, this guy is awesome. So I watched like a whole bunch of his videos in a row, and I can say that um, I, I've been missing a few of his more recent videos, but I can say that he, he's an unbelievably talented guy. I can say mm -hmm. that for all the YouTubers that I watch, um, he's probably, in my opinion, um, he has the most comedic talent, and he's probably one of the... Uh, the more genuine people out there. I think that uh, he, he's kind of, I forget what the word is, but he's uh, very much a jack of all trades when it comes to talent because uh, he put out an album, mm. uh, which, what, what was it? He's got uh, two, uh, Pink Nation recently. Right, and that the other one is... Uh, uh, no, Pink Season Pink, is the Pink one. Season, and then uh, uh, I forget what the first one was, Pink Guy maybe? Uh, I've got it on my iTunes. <laughs> yeah, on. but anyways... This is how bad I am. He put out Pink Season recently, and what pissed me off, and I can say this, is I thought this album was fucking great. And even, mm. um, oh, God, what's his name? Um, Anthony Fantano, yeah, he actually yeah. reviewed and gave it a good score, and it rightly deserved, mm. in my opinion. I thought this mm. album was great. Um, they actually took down White is Right 
from, and really? I'm not even joking. They took down that song from iTunes, from <sighs> uh, Spotify, through like three or four other distribution like platforms. They took that song away. Well, and they didn't and, take something like I'm, Peanut Butter, which is about dogs licking his balls. <laughs> no, no, it's because it's because that they actually. I I honestly believe that that uh, many of these platforms right now are under an extreme mm. amount of pressure socially within their own organization and politically from different entities that honestly believe. Um, and I was actually going to do a video about this at some point because I mentioned in the stream that I was in with Sargon that ever since Hillary Clinton gave that alt-right speech, there are a considerable amount of people mm. within the United States specifically that honestly believe that we are like living in fucking 1953 Louisiana. Like, there are fucking Klansmen on the street. I'm not even joking. They believe that. I know. You're right, that mate. There are you're right. on the street. And that is, that is my opinion of why that song was taken down, that they were pressured. Because even if it is satire, which it is, it is a satirization of white pride. Regardless of that, they demanded it taken down, and it was. Because it was taken down within a week's time from all of those platforms. And that is not a coincidence. It's totally not. And it's funny that a half Japanese, half Australian guy yes. is getting it, censored because it it's, a it's a satirization of white pride. And it actually points out the mm. fact that if one was to actually could the, to consider the notion of white privilege or whatever, it's actually a matter of class pri privilege because what it does is it satiriz satirizes specifically like white pride in the South and it showcases it as empty and stupid and vacuous and it doesn't really have any kind of real uh background to it which is and what go I, ahead what, like is it shows the working class version of it which is the i can't read i can't write yeah, yeah, that's what i'm talking about but at the same time it also it, it actually yeah. also satirizes um upper middle class white mm. kids from really privileged connected families mm -hmm. And like the that, is, that is that is genuine. That, that is mm. something that does exist within the United States. If you are from an upper middle class family, it doesn't matter white or black or anything, but if you're mm. from a well-connected, well-to-do family, you can get away with a lot of shit in this country. Yeah, and that's it's, just it's the influenza people, isn't it? Like, that yes. guy who got, who got away with yes. it. I was just like, what? Yeah, landed gentry could get away with that. Seriously, we still have those types here. Yeah, you Who guys have your own, like, uh, we, we have the sort of the same thing, although with you guys is a little more built in with like your old school, like fraternity type guys that belong to all those kind yeah. of weird social clubs. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, I mean, I, I was a part of a social group in uni, but it's different for me. Yeah, that, well, then, that, it's like, there's, it, but these, th these kind of organizations are only uh, open to the upper crust of society. Like you have to be somebody's son to actually make it into one of those organizations. Mm. It's mad because they go with the same people who they'll end up working with in government, whether it's labor. Yes. I mean, okay, with labor, yeah. with labor, it's less, the less kind of in that Oxford, Oxbridge kind of place. But even then, some of them are still there and they're going to be eventually fighting these people for parliament. And it's crazy. God, it's incestuous. <laughs> it really yeah. is. Yeah. It's just, it's just a weird kind of um, connection and. Like it's just people within a certain brand. It's it's like a different sort of social strata that uh, was very much only open uh, once upon a time to at least in the United States standard of what what's called even till this day of old money, which is families that yeah can old be money back like, way back when in that they hmm. were basically these are families that came out of the industrial era as investors. These people invested in Carnegie. Hmm. In Standard Oil and all of that shit, and they made their money there and have been rich mm. ever since. And they're still you know, around. It's funny though, the people, the people who actually know Pennsylvania was founded by a family, right? Mm -hmm. Rich British family. They're still around and they can still lay claim to it. Right. You know, most if, of the old want... families that, that once existed are mm. still around now. Mm. Uh, there's mm. only been a few that like you can really trace to like their old roots, but. Um, like that guy uh, mm. on Twitter that I did that video on, Eric Garland, like he can trace his roots all the way back to the founding of the country, allegedly, mm. you know, if, if the documents he provided are right. But it, the thing is, though, that um, even if you go back that far, the issue is, is that you actually have to maintain your connections and maintain your wealth. If you don't do those two things, then you become this fucking Eric Garland guy on Twitter and you're just a joke. <laughs> oh, destiny. I'm on it. <laughs> no, it, he's, I don't think he's old money. I think he's just a fucking nah, he's not. maniac. 
Would I be considered old? No, I wouldn't be considered old money. I'd be considered a bloody colonialist, wouldn't I? If I went over to America. <laughs> no, I mean, if you were um, <laughs> old money, like I said, is from you. Ha old money, at least from the American standard, is the the people that made their money with the robber barons back in the industrial era. They they've been rich for about a hundred years or so. I mean, to be fair, over here it's like it's hard to explain because it, it's so many different families have come over. It it's. Literally, a lot of the landed gentry, even what you would consider English, technically, would be German, French. Right. Uh, low, you know, I mean, actually, is there any, well, no Anglo-Saxons exist. It's just, it's, I never got the whole term, like, the Anglo-Saxon worlds, like, they don't exist anymore. They haven't for at least a couple hundred years. That, that, yeah, definitely. That, that did actually once exist in the United States, for fucking sure. Uh, the, the, even to the state. Yeah. I always thought the South was a bit like England in the sense. No, got people no, not at all, dude. It was the North. No, I don't. I don't. Well, what do you mean, landowners are in the North? I always thought the South because you know plantations. Well, it, it's no, but the difference is uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. That's the North, mm. and then uh, white landowning Baptist. That was the South. Oh, because it's weird. Because in the Civil War, they wanted the South wanted Britain to join their side because we're related, right? And I'm like, yeah. Uh, considering, no, bro, it's because they, they were looking for anybody to come intervene because they didn't have yeah, the numbers, they didn't have the technology. And it's funny though, because why would Britain do that when it was their policy to get rid of any slave ships that uh, were in the world? So, yeah, you I mean, just literally you gotta, zealous. I mean, I, I still have to look it up. How did the uh, the the Germans ally with the Japanese? You know, why would the Japanese uh, ally with the Germans? I should know that. I don't know that. I have my degrees. I, don't know I just haven't looked it up. The Eastern Power Block to surround Britain, I presume. And because you know, globe globe spanning empire. We've got in in Europe, Gibraltar and Malta, and Isle of Cyprus. Man. And uh, well, Isle of Man is right next to the Northwest near me, and they're a protectorate. They're not really part of the uk it's hard to explain but um yeah, they've always been there. territory they're just there then and they, they were never a naval base anyway although they do have one of the oldest parliaments in europe but um and malta gibraltar and cyprus were the big ones they didn't get malta although they nearly did that was like a massive siege but the germans failed to break it but the the japanese singapore like loads of different like they controlled about the, the entirety of the Pacific, including a decent chunk of China, we, which was weird. We under yeah, we underestimated them when we shouldn't have because they they white they were de defeating countries a hundred times their size. Yeah, they <laughs> like Japan's the same size as England, not Britain yeah. actually. It's how can you underestimate that? Like I remember watching a documentary and the guy said, "Yeah, we thought their planes were made of bamboo." It's like <sighs> <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> Yeah, no. Well, I mean, you, the what... thing is, though, with them is that, I mean, they industrialized really fucking mm. quick. Mm. And, you know, I, I think that it, it makes a little bit sense uh, to underestimate them because they, um, you know, they, they were an isolationist nation for mm. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And mm. it was actually, actually researched just not that long ago that they actually radicalized and became an imperialist expansionist mm. nation really fucking quick really fucking oh, uh, quick. well i'm pretty sure they had korea before they had they they'd industrialized i mean they were kind of yeah, they, they did have some territory but it was like that was something different that was like the first yeah. territory they had taken in hundreds and hundreds of years but yeah it was there, made you yeah. the restoration that guy yeah i'd have to look up his name but yeah it was the one emperor that basically changed the dynamic of what it what it meant to be the emperor um, I think it was like he was supposed to be like the head of the church or what would be the equivalent. And then there was a head of state instead, but actually he then, based it, yeah, he, he, then he took over both like roles Britain. and yeah. And he took over both roles and that's when basically he just stepped up and said, it's, you know, I'm the divine power. We're fucking expanding because it is our right. And we're, we are the superior Asian people. And uh, they probably still think kind of like that to this day. They still think they're a little bit superior. Yeah, but I mean, in all fairness, I, I mean, it's about every mm. fucking country in the East Asia, based on what I've seen. Mm. The Koreans think that, both South and mm. North. Um, the Chinese absolutely think that, and so do, in some parts, uh, the Japanese, they think the same way. 
But I mean, that's unfortunately, that's one of the consequences, in my opinion, of being super collectivist, which all those mm. nations are. Japanese especially, like how they work, how they how they, yeah. how they industrialize. You know what's weird though? Speaking of the Industrial Revolution and American Civil War, I was meant to tell you this. My 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 city, Manchester, not Manchester, uh, New Hampshire, but the actual one, the OG Manchester. We were um, mm -hmm. the cotton cotton manufacturing city of the world. And our our workers, as far as I know, all of them, this they, they all put they all like made the petition, sent it to Abraham Lincoln, giving him their full support against slavery oh wow yo that's yeah, not surprising a... um that was one of the things i talked to sargon about that uh mm. you guys over there were definitely the, the like the proto-abolitionists and were so for quite a while yeah but i've always wondered like did they actually get the cotton from there at least by that point i'm pretty sure we had india and other places but i was i was really it was like a proud moment for me i was like yes even back then and it just proves to the SJWs and even to the alt right to an extent that even 150 years ago they're not they weren't but not everyone was racist maybe to our no, standards i, yeah, I but, mean that's it, yeah. honestly that is just a stupid mm -hmm. position that they hold and i can say that it's easy to fall for the thing is that you're gonna I, like i can't speak to the uk because i can under it's really weird over there that you guys have this sort of obsession of just labeling random people racist and everyone just sort of goes with it mm -hmm. They don't say anything. They don't do anything. They're just kind of like, oh, okay. And it's just like, <laughs> man, it, I've seen it too many times. And Tommy Robinson is a good example of that. And I made the joke on Twitter earlier and no one got it. Well, the but thing every, with him, every time it's, go ahead. he was the leader of the EDL. And he went on, at least in his early career, he went on numerous BBC interviews and bombed hard, like really didn't do well. And he came across as one. And then he left. And then he's become... At least the more I see him, the less he appears to be racist now. But at the time, he seemed to be. Yeah, it, it may have been the case that once upon mm. a time, he actually could have been more racist than he is now. But I think that mm. the, the unfortunate part of that is one of the things that I've commonly seen with him, and it's one of the, his best points, is the person that accuses him of being racist, which they will commonly do, he mm. basically says this over and over again. He says, what have I said that's racist? What have I said that's racist? What have I said that's racist? And they never fucking answer the question and if they did they said okay on december 4th in 1994 you said fuck the niggers and it's like wow tommy robinson said that but he's they never answer it so to me it's just someone that's standing on a soapbox pointing their finger mm -hmm. saying that this guy's a racist when i have yet to hear anything by him and people have said maybe he said something about white genocide but nothing's been ever shown to me so i don't know well, the more i think about it the more i look back the more i think yeah maybe he does have a point that he wasn't the more I look back, I think, was I just, was I, was I thinking? You may have just been reading into what he was saying, and it's yeah. easy to do. You know, if you have somebody that's not articulate mm. about what they're saying. and he isn't. He isn't. Yeah. <clears throat> He's working class, and that's his background, and I think that's, unfortunately, yeah. the, the only time, I think he did it, he had a speech in Oxford at some mm, point. He did, yeah. And that was very good. And I think that that mm. was one of the things that made me look at him and go, wow, like, why aren't he people scripted listening it, that's to this why. guy? Well, yeah, exactly. He's, he's not. He's not like my family. We're working class, but we're also kind of okay when it comes to articulation. He probably mm -hmm. isn't. I think it's a family trait. No, he, he sounded um, like he grew up in kind of a rough area. Uh, not really. Well, to me, it wasn't. But to some people looking outside, yeah, I guess Old Trafford. Yeah, that's where I come from originally. Luton? That's an area in Manchester, which is. No, no, Luton's where he comes from. I right, come right. from Old Trafford in Manchester, which is working class to the core. Okay. It's fun, funny, though. Funny enough, though, that was that is an area where multiculturalism actually worked. Because, <laughs> like, I, I don't remember ever being the victim of racism or seeing any issues as far as I can, I can be aware. And I lived there till I was 14. Right. So I just, so when I ended up, you know, getting older and learning more stuff, I was like, that wasn't my experience but i knew it happened but like i just thought it can't be can't be like sweden was like alien to me because that's not what i had like on my street white families asian families mixed race families like myself and a few others down the road it's like idea well the idea they were asian areas and stuff like that but like well, I, I think it has to mingle depends. and you walk down you walk down the main street and it's like there's loads of different people and nobody's like 
weird. I, I, right. When yeah, I found I, out I mean, about all that stuff, it was like blew my mind. You know. It, it depends on the area. I can say that one of the unfortunate mm-hmm. things that you'll find in different places that you'll see definitely in France, and it's something that you'll see in the United States, is that you'll basically see um, not enforced segregation, but nonetheless segregation, where you will have. It, oh, it happened over here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because what happened with Britain when we got the when the immigrants came over by request initially, um, and they they would have been in, with the, in like white neighbourhoods, but then eventually, as because the housing authorities are shit over here, right? So they end up just putting loads of you know Caribbean people, Nini people with other Indian and Caribbean people, because why right. not? Right? Kind of like oh, you know they'll be okay there. It, yeah, it's and not then, a good it, idea. It, it created the de facto segregation. It meant, was it yeah. de sure? No, de facto. It's but the, in some areas, it, it, it did melt, make a melting pot. Right. It depends. It, it, it can and happen. What didn't but help the, was, re- yeah. It, it, like I was going to say that it, it like the, the, the sort of placement of people and all that sort of thing, like it can actually work out. And I can say that one of the things that you'll see, um, at least in my own experience, has been uh, living near Buffalo. In Buffalo, it's very segregated, and there are different, like, er- you can basically see from street to street which area you're in. Like, this is the part of Buffalo that is, like, old Polish town. This is the part that's all Latinos. This is the part that's all Caribbean. This is the part that's old school black. Like, there are very clearly designated spots of the city, and for the most part, there's no real um, uh, tension, in large part, mm-hmm. between the different races. Um past a certain age but there is like newer tensions with uh honestly from what i've seen caribbean people and black people they seem to like the younger they seem to be having issues with one another it's it's to do with it's 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 similar over here but i think that, that was an older thing i've not heard anything since but uh Carib- I've, I've traditionally caribbean and african people have not particularly gotten along due to history because I think I could be wrong. I've only heard this from people I know, who were Caribbean and African. That um, essentially it's slavery. The Caribbeans blame the Africans for slaving for selling them off. And mm-hmm. It's kind of a, what Doctor Random McCann calls grudge racism. I think it comes from that, or it could just be, you know, one of those things where you just don't get along. I don't know, but I think that might be one of the things. I don't know. It's it's possible. I I can't really speak to because the thing is with. Um, there are definitely parts of uh, the country, at least in my own country, that the segregation has actually been similar, but it's actually backfired in many ways. And one of the good examples of that are parts of Chicago in, in Illinois, because you have like a core part of it that's black, that's very poor, and then you have white server, suburbs all around it. And that, unfortunately, has led to a lot of tension. And now with the fucking gang violence completely crazy, it leads to a lot more, to, uh, uh, um, you know, division because you have a lot of, uh, you know, working class and middle class white families looking at the inner city and saying, like, it's not gang violence, it's the blacks. And unfortunately, that's the thing you kind of see because if every, if mm. day after day after day you see people on the television screen, this is who di- this is who died, this is who shot them, and it's, Black eye, black eye, black eye, black eye, black eye, black eye, black eye. Unfortunately, you start assuming the next guy that's going to be on the television that's going to be a shooter is going to be black. But, you know, you have to think but about it and say, well, like, it's also going to be the victim. If you think about it, 90 years ago, during Al Capone's heyday, I mean, I don't know if any of the demographics have changed. It might have been the same. But one of those areas, for example, could have been an all-white in the city area. Then it became all black. There, there used to not used to be the Italians or the Polish, you know. It the, could have been the, difference, the difference back then is that there, that uh, many of the different races that existed back then were actually differentiated. Like the white Protestants mm-hmm. distinguished themselves as being white mm-hmm. Protestants. And they said, well, we don't trust the Catholics. And who are the Catholics? Mm-hmm. The Italians and the Irish. So we don't trust them. And you had, uh, and they also didn't like the Germans. They didn't like the Polish. Mm-hmm. They didn't like any of the people that came over in large part, um, but they especially didn't like the Irish and the Italians until the Irish and Italians basically became, you know, mayors, became assemblymen, became uh, head, you know, head of, head of police forces, it became all the police forces, became all the corrections officers. So it's <laughs> like, it's hard then to start, and they unionized especially. Mm. So they basically took in many ways 
uh, the, the power that was centralized, the, the Protestants away from them and became more middle class. And unfortunately with uh, black people, um, it's just really been one of those things where, where racism once existed, it's now gone, but you've had the breakdowns of the families and in very much impoverished areas. So they don't really have the same ability that you see today or you saw then anyways, of being able to, you know, just walk into out of high school into a factory, work your ass off until you die early, and then move your family up a notch, or hopefully move them, yeah. you know, in a decent area. And I think it's that unfortunately, to yeah, it's over here. It happens to everybody, and like, you know, it was mainly a white working class thing. I mean, the immigrants came over to do that as well, but it was mainly a white working class thing because you'll you'll find some of the uh, Chinese, especially. Indian especially, they would create their own businesses or so corner shops. Absolutely. You, that's you know, that's unfortunately the downside that, that and unfortunately it seems as though like for immigrants to the United States, and there are many from many different nations that are extremely entrepreneurial. And that's what you can see with almost every Asian wave that we've had in the United States. They have, it's always been a mark of them that they've been extremely entrepreneurial and that moves you up pretty fucking quick. And a lot of them vote Tory. The, the, uh, well, oh, yeah. actually, I don't know. I know they do have a quite a large Asian base, the Conservative Party. They always have done. But um, the problem was, which created, that, in my opinion, created not just segregation in terms of race, not not, not as much, but definitely the factor in having maybe places like Luton and Wickham, places like that, was we, we were regenerating the areas. We were knocking down slums and terrace housing and mm -hmm. creating flats and all sorts of crap housing you know with good intentions to give these people a decent living because it was a socialist the democratic socialist government conservative and labor all agreed with consensus to adopt this mm -hmm. in 1946 and they were just trying to you know keep the plan going and then the problem was they were knocking the building down and communities that were living there doesn't matter what they were were getting like split up so they would go yeah. one place especially in my city down the road they'd be here then they'd be there one family then another family would come from another place there they don't know each other so it'd be destroying all semblance of community cohesion and i think yeah. that's another reason that caused it and then the factories are closing down in the 70s and the 80s and it's like well shit here we are with an underclass that rioted uh six years ago now so yeah, I would say that the, the, the civil strife that I've heard about in your country is a, a bit oh, different yeah. from the stuff that's going on in my country. Um, it was the white people who uh, rioted here. Right, I mean, yeah. actually, funny enough, it started off with a mixed race guy getting shot in Tottenham, and then that happened. Then they had to bring police from other areas, and then the next thing we know, like mostly white English people started rioting. And Owen Jones did a book on this, and it's like... I mean, no, I know Owen Jones, right? But that was when he first started out and didn't become what he is now, a joke. But, um, right, right. I, I've been told oh, he has a decent or was he? Oh, or was he always a joke? Who knows? But he was spot on with that. But my mum, right, she she got she was, she was doesn't like him. And she was like, I've been saying that for 30 years. And he's just made a book about it. <laughs> but like, yeah, that rioted. And, and people were perplexed. Like, why had they rioted? Was it because it was lack of police so they could just do what they wanted? Or was it another reason? Um, you'll either get people who say it's just wanton destruction, they just wanted to do it, or were they taking out their frustrations for being unemployed and not having any prospects? But but one thing for certain is they come from a particular part of the of Britain that nobody really tries to talk about unless they're taking the piss. The underclass. So yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it's something that you're going to likely see in uh, pretty much every capitalistic society, although that's not really, you know, the reason to, you know, mm. have some sort of radical change. But mm. it is to say that if you have a certain demographic within your own country that is being, mm. that is essentially the underclass, that you're going to have to do something to try to provide them some sort of uh, minimum standard and some yeah. some kind of purpose, because if they feel completely neglected and uh, silenced and they it, that sort of thing generates sort of like a nihilistic, ugly culture from that. And you can see that definitely within the United States, uh, white or black, although it's more pronounced in black urban areas where there are riots. Um, that That is a consequence of many things. But I think mm -hmm. that in large part, it is due to the fact that like, 
you know, that, that's a demographic of people, uh, like I said, white or black, that haven't had any kind of proper representation in probably 60 years. And you know what started all that? Thatcher. Her monetarism policies, her, neo, what they call it, neoliberalism? Yeah. Was it? That's why I don't like the whole classic, no, classical liberalism, liberalism, liberalism as well. That's what they called it. Neoclassical liberalism economics. Yeah, it, it's That's why I don't like the term classical liberal. The Ugh. problem is that most of like those sort of like right leaning uh, types mm -hmm. of, I guess you could call it um, perspectives or philosophies mm -hmm. that unfortunately I think that many of them started with ideals. And I can understand mm -hmm. it a lot in some part the ideals of being a neoliberal, of being like a globalist or um you know even being like a neoconservative but the issue is though that every single one of those philosophies and perspectives got uh completely overtaken by corporatism and that's in my opinion why you're seeing this new rise in nationalism is because there there is no sense of neoliberalism anymore that is not just corporatist there is no neoconservatism that is not just corporatist so your choice is yeah go ahead Another issue is that she purged the party of all the older people, older conservatives who are more with consensus. So that basically there was nothing stopping corporatism from taking the foot. They couldn't just say, hey, no, got rid of them all systematically. Yeah. You can watch Hitchens talk about it. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, that's unfortunately been the case of uh, pretty much any Western nation, honestly, any Western nation, even throughout like Europe. Um, you know, it's every one of these nations have been dominated by corporatists for years and years and years longer than, you know, much longer than I've been alive. And I Me think too. that, I think that unfortunately, most of that is actually spawned out of the United States. I think that we kind of pioneered corporatism and that it's essentially spread all over the world. And in my opinion, you now see it spreading to Asia. Mm -hmm. You can see it spreading there because you have China. Shinzo Abe. Yeah, and, and you can see it in China, and you can see it w in Japan now, and in, in Korea as well. You can see it in these nations where they are basically taking on the mantle of, oh, well, I'm actually a, a, a middle ground kind of conservative. I'm not a social conservative. I'm a new conservative. And it's like, it's the mm -hmm. same shit. You're doing the trade deals. You're, you're uh, annihilating labor. You're, you're just another corporatist in the making. And <laughs> what's funny, it's funny and amazing now with Shinzo Abe in, in Japan, mm -hmm. He's a fucking feminist. He's out there preaching yeah. feminism. <laughs> and it's like, and that's, he, he knows, he knows how it works. He knows mm -hmm. what to say. He knows what to do. And I've been, I've had a bunch of people that actually live in Japan that follow me to some degree mm -hmm. say to me that I'm actually wrong, but I'm sitting here like red lights. Like I'm not wrong. This is the exact shit they did to us. Like, what are you doing? You're following us right off the cliff. Of he's he's kind of like that true though. Isn't he? He's like that Trudeau in many ways. He's basically, I don't even... He's right-wing? Yeah, he's conservative. He's a is conservative he right-wing? Yes. Yeah. He's yeah. actually like, he, he's like a faux nationalist. He basically panders to like the nationalists in Japan, mm. but at the same time, he's a globalist. Mm. <laughs> double think. Oh my God, that double think, man. That That's just, that's off the charts. Only in Japan, mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's the thing is like, it's just, you have somebody up there that's just an opportunist and that's, he's like, and the thing is with him as well, when you, I've seen him speak in a few speeches and he's slick, man, he is slick. Hmm. And that's, that's the biggest thing to fear because that was what uh, was the real curse of Ronald Reagan was that he was likable and slick and he had hmm. all his cronies just running around doing everything hmm. crazy that they can get away with. And he was the face I of did, all of I it. Did, I, I did read something about him going like kind of, before he he got really sick, he was in some cases he was really battling those cronies because he didn't agree with everything they were doing. I think he wanted to do well, certain the, things. The issue I is is that, he, that his administration, right? No, I'm I'm, I know what you're saying, but the thing mm. is with him is that his entire administration mm. was just an embarrassment for him and for mm. conservatives. It should have been because the way that it started was that they actually had a solid base of conservatives, and what they did was they attached themselves to this group called the moral majority. And those were like oh, the yeah. Christians of the era. Well, as time went on, um, it, it just all completely fell apart. And the only reason that he won the, his reelection was that he didn't have any kind of meaningful opposition because That's he reneged on a ton of shit. Mm -hmm. And like his, his administration had nonstop scandals, nonstop mm -hmm. indictments. The, the, there's been more arrests and convictions in his administration than any, any administration oh, 
in the history Mate, of the United States. It was the same here. Like it wasn't just Kinnock. I remember you mentioning Kinnock, didn't you? Neil Kinnock, was it you? No, I don't About think it Thatcher? was. It might have been someone else, but um, basically, it wasn't just Neil Kinnock, who the leader of the Labour Party in about eighty-four to eighty-nine, something like that. The whole Labour Party was in shambles. Right now, funnily enough, the same. You know, they had better politicians back then than they do now. The problem was that either the policies were too extreme for people, or they just they had weak leaders. Like the one person that they should have they should have put in, could have won, was someone called Foot. I forgot his first name because he was a little bit more panderable to the audience. And they were anti-EU at the time when there was probably a bit more pro-EU sentiment at the time. And they wanted to renationalize certain things that I think the majority of the country probably didn't agree with. But other than that, the things that they were arguing for was much better than what Thatcher was arguing for because at least they would have kept a few more industrial jobs than we do now, which is mm -hmm. hardly any. But the problem is they, they just couldn't, they couldn't do it. They, they weren't. They weren't electable for years. Even John Major got in. That's how bad they were. John Bloody Major. Yeah. Who actually organized essentially a coup against her. You know, like you know when you. Uh, this is party politics here. We don't really vote for people. We vote for parties. So right. it's not beyond. It's not beyond British parties to just go. You know what? This new this prime minister. She's run her course. He's run her course. Let's let's get someone in. Let's force her to resign. It, it really is. Actually. It really is Isn't the it? opposite here. The 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 person, the face of the party, is really what becomes the party, and mm -hmm. that's what you see, especially nowadays, with Hillary Clinton. Hillary, like mm -hmm. the when you say the Democratic Party, what you really mean is the Clinton Party, mm -hmm. because every the the party is absolutely in step with what she believes, and it's about as bad as I've seen it, at least in my lifetime, in that way, mm -hmm. where it it used to be in part the party of Bill Clinton and sort of like this holdover from the, the 70s where you had like a, a bit of an environmental side of it, but it was kind of just sort of pandering. Jimmy and, Carter? Yeah, Jimmy Jimmy Carter was actually part of that. But even in that time, one of the things that about Jimmy Carter was Jimmy Carter pandered in, just mm. incessantly to the religious, just pandered and pandered. Really? And he thought that, yes. You'd never know it unless you actually knew something about him. He was extremely religious. No way. He never, ever came across that way in yeah, any like, interview. Jimmy or Carter was extremely religious. I thought he was a peanut farmer from wherever no. they grow peanuts. Well, yes, he was, but he was, yeah. in, he was, he was very religious. And unfortunately, wow. that weighed him down a bit because he thought that winning the moral majority uh, like side of it was the way to win, but unfortunately, it wasn't. It's just that he's so liberal. He it, wasn't like, really. He wasn't. They seem, they seem, people say the same thing about JFK and LBJ and all of them. They weren't really all that liberal. They were pretty fucking authoritarian in that. Mm. Well, I'd um, say LBJ was more liberal than Kennedy. I mean, he actually got shit done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he took a huge risk with the Civil Rights Act. Mm. You know, he, he really, I mean, uh, he used to have, like, he'd have, like, some racist tirades that got recorded and all mm. that. But, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure you, you, you get, when you pass the Civil Rights Act and you basically mm. doom your party to losing an entire segment geographic location mm. you know that's a ballsy move and not a, you know obviously you're doing it for the right reasons the dixie crats right yeah they they uh it, it immediately died um you don't have that over here. Uh, like you wouldn't have right wing well uh, you have new labor but even then the vote they're trying to pander to the same voting base we don't have like like the people who vote labor in the south think the same reason i'm not i'm not trying to collectivize them or generalize but Overall, on the same issues, they tend to think the same way as a Labour supporter up here. You wouldn't get that. Yeah, you know, I, I can't here. really like, see Democrats. I think different to Northern Democrats. Yeah, so basically, with the Dixiecrats, that was actually kind of like an alliance that was established a long mm. time ago, and it had to do with like the the basically once upon a time there was like an element of the Democratic Party that was uh, perfectly fine, and those the Dixiecrats were among them that were perfectly fine with the federal government doing things to basically help farmers help. Because uh, mm -hmm. for a long time in the South, you didn't have electricity, you didn't have proper mm -hmm. plumbing, you had to, you just didn't have the modernization that you had in the North, and you actually had federal uh, government programs spending a lot of fucking money in the South to actually build it up, mm -hmm. and that was one of the ways that they won votes. And unfortunately, with the Civil Rights Act in that era, that was kind of the tipping point. Where I think that um, you know, if we, it's hard to just write it off all as just racism, but it, you had a lot of people basically saying like 
this party is no longer listening to me. And that was then basically they, then the, the Republicans stepped up and took over those votes. And, and you did have you did have political operatives within the Republican Party and cynically doing so. I don't think that every Republican that ran or anything was a racist, but you had, you know, plenty of political operatives in the South uh, just you know, getting on stage saying "nigger this, nigger that," and that was pretty much how they won elections. For being <laughs> honest, you and you. The thing is, though, and it's still amazing to this day. You will have people that, even on my own channel, Southerners, that will deny until their fucking dying day that there was ever a single fucking racist in the South. <laughs> that the Civil War had anything to do with race or slavery. You know, it really like the apologia to this day from like twenty somethings is still <laughs> like it's like living. <laughs> Like you're 1953 talking to some hit. I feel like these, 90 years old. I feel like they're they're the, the new South types who you know they the the idea of the Confederate flag is Southern pride, not not white pride. You know, so the kind of no, it's it's not. It, it really isn't. Like it actually has a lot really? more to do with like a different kind of ideology that the the most people that you'll find basically with the Confederate flag. It, it's mm. just like I I've my experience with them has been not a matter of like them being racist in any way. It's just been a matter of just this weird rebelliousness towards anything that they consider to be uh if you know effective yeah. on what they believe. You know, and, and I mean yeah, effective that, in the way of was, like impacting yeah. them directly. And that's so they rebel against it. Yeah, yeah right, they're right. In the, they're in denial of of that what actually went on because they, they don't want those associations, which you can understand because they've been labeled racist you know they're not and they just yeah. want to be so yeah, they, they've been they've been pounded pretty hard for quite a long time and i can say that for the most part you know mm. if you went down south in the united states you'd be hard pressed to just run into a, a full-throated racist it, it, it's about there's about as many down mm. south as, as there is anywhere else in the united states uh, but the issue is that, you know, in my opinion, with it, when it comes to the Confederate flag and the, the different sort of things that they have down south that, you know, to anyone that's not from there that is saturated in that culture, it does come across as something that was once connected with racism because it was. Mm. And, you know, it's hard for people, you know, in the north or in coastal cities or wherever to really get past that. They kind of frown upon it. And I think that honestly, with a lot of the people that do wear the Confederate flag, and there's people in my neighborhood that have the Confederate flag outside their home. Mm. Um, unfortunately, what you'll find is that for every 10 people that you'll see with like a Confederate flag on their car or a Confederate flag, like a uh, back visor on their pickup truck mm. or whatever, a flag on their house, whatever you'll find, out of 10 people, one of those people will be a full-throated racist. And yeah. it's those full-throated racists that you'll basically never forget. Because it's, I can tell you that I've run into them before, and you'll never fucking forget them. It, it's like before 2012, before the Olympics, it, it wasn't. It was common. I, I I think less so now, but before 2012, with the Olympics, before we had this big rush of patriotism, there was like the the English flag, especially and the British flag, it was considered by a lot of people racist because of the NF, which is the National Front, which was our which right. was the violent wing of the British Nationalist Party. Or were okay, they, yeah. actually were they separate or were they? Oh no! Actually, it might have been the NF became the British Nationalist Party, but they yeah. were like they were they were the people who went who went in, uh, took the skinhead culture or at least the look of skinhead culture, and then you know started doing the racist thuggery shit, and yeah. that became associated with them because they would go out with the flags and shit. And then yeah, I've so seen some of their marches. They walk around like crosses and shit to mess with Muslims and all that. And I'm not, you know, I'm not against like people that's marching with crosses and shit. You know what I mean? That's, like, that's the EDL. They're, they're they're more. They're like. Are you sure? I thought it was the BNP. No, EDL. The EDL are very religious. I've noticed they're very into mm. Christianity, and they go into they go into mosques and they try and cause issues. Apart from one instance where a mosque invited them in, they were going to go in and cause trouble. But then the mosque said, "Hey, come in, have a cup of tea." Well, that was smart of them to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, but that's I, the I, thing is that that's that's pretty much how you're going to if you want to kill off those kind mm. of parties. That's what the mosques have to mm. do. They have to do that. They have to now, say, come on in. I have no idea if that was a moderate mosque or a radical mosque. I assume it was a moderate one. There's no way the radicals would have done that. But Yeah, I, I don't think the radicals would have invited them in. Well, there is Takia, but I don't think even that goes that far. I mean, you would have to be pretty pacifist to invite them in for tea and make the headlines. Right. Well, I, I can say that, at least in defense of the people today that wear Confederate flags that I have come across, I can say that one of the unfortunate parts is that 
they're, they're going to constantly be barraged with that, that, especially if they're in the north or they're in a cold. Like if you're in the, I can only imagine what would happen if you're in California and you're wearing a Confederate flag. Even though I can that was only fucking imagine far away from the bloody civil war. It wasn't even was it even no, a state it, at that time? Uh, I actually had to look to see if it was a state because I know we had people there. Hmm. We had Spanish to... people usually. <laughs> <laughs> but you um but in any case, the uh hmm. the issue is with it that unfortunately today, you know, for every you know, Confederate flag wearing racist, hmm. you're gonna have somebody that's like you know, a uh, not, like past the point of like a Black Lives mm. Matter guy, uh, mm. like a, a Black Power, Black supremacist kind of guy, like mm. We Was Kang sort of type. Mm. You have you have no idea how many like of those guys exist in the United States. There are a oh. ton of fucking Black supremacists oh, out there. Oh, the the beginning to become a big thing here. Well, not a big thing, but the beginning to make roll here. But thankfully, uh, Black Lives Matter UK are a laughing stock, and I because oh, yeah, um, they're all run by white people. <laughs> well, down south, yeah. That's that was the case, but me and cognitive thought. I don't know if you've heard of him. I I know the name. Yeah, he's an um, another Mank YouTuber. We we actually we've met. Well, that's when we first met, uh, in person at least. We went and his brother. We went to a Black Lives Matter meeting in like a, a building in Manchester, and we watched them. I've got I've actually I recorded it, and it's on my channel, but I have not uploaded it yet because we were going to use it for a video, but never did. So yeah. I'm still I'm still wondering should I release it or not? Hmm. Probably probably just release it because I, I actually just... I, I tried to get some footage myself because there was a Black Lives Matter protest in Buffalo and they were they were like immediately violent like people they were like blocking traffic and people I mean people in my area man especially if they're working class they they have no tolerance for that kind of shit and I especially wouldn't myself. Yeah. So basically the the vehicles were like pushing into them, you know, basically <laughs> forcing them out of the way because. Bro, people, if you're in the crosswalk in this area, bro, they don't stop. They don't give a shit. Is it, is it the same in Buffalo? I'm walking here, or is that just the... No, it's... Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's the... I'm walking here, but the people in the cars are flipping you off saying, get the fuck out of the way. Like, it's it's pretty much that, but... Now, what I want to know is, what is the difference between the rest of New York and the city? What is the difference? Well, um, the rest... Well, okay, I can say for New York City, New York City is basically, like... It is it, it my opinion of New York City is if you took San Francisco, yeah, and you replaced Silicon Valley with um, uh, Wall Street. Yeah. So it is basically like a more corporatist version of San Francisco. I was so thinking it is, more New Jersey. You know, like no, it's not. I mean, there are, there are people, but the thing is, though, the people from fucking New York, and there there are many people that have that kind of style in New York, but you're going to find more hipster, like middle class dickheads that just mm. want to pretend to be fucking like working class than you are. Like a guy oh, that's like, an example, oh. Colin, Colin Moratti mm. is the class example of this. He yeah. acts like he's this big, tough fucking conservative, but he's a fucking middle class pussy from Long Island. Like mm. he grew up in an upper middle class family. And Who is this? Tom, Tom. No, uh, uh, Colin Moratti. Oh, oh, Colin. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. He he grew up in an upper just, middle class Long Island you're family. Just, you're just entitled. You're just entitled. Yeah, well that's well that's pretty much his thing. Deserve. Well his thing his thing, the funny thing about him is that he styles himself to be this like, you know, I'm this hard working conservative from a conservative family. I know what it's like to being uh being a hard worker, independent, free thinking conservative. And he's a fucking he he was a journalist at the biggest corporatist organization, shill organization in gaming for like ten years. Wait, is he conservative? Yes, he's a libertarian. He's like no uh, he's way. he isn't a trad con, but he's like a, a yeah. libertarian conservative. And yet he's the yeah he's in bed with these SJWs creating this anti gay Yes, because he makes money. Yeah, it's, it's because he's a fucking chill, bro. It's at his core. <laughs> the thing is that he styles himself to be like this. Basically, like he thinks himself, he, he considers himself to be like this free thinking, tough guy conservative, mm. but he's just like some upper middle class guy from Long Island. And anyways. Mm. Um, to the state, with New York State, basically you have uh, East Coast, San Francisco, and New York City. And then the minute you go north in New York, you have some university towns right by New York City, and then it is just fucking 100% just rural farming land with, like, redneck conservatives 
and you have that pretty much from there all the way up to Albany, where Albany is like uh, just kind of like a lower class city. Then you go up to Rochester, which is kind of like mini Buffalo, except with way more gang violence. And <laughs> then you have Buffalo, and it, like basically outside of those cities, it is pure rural rednecks. There are right a lot in, of conservatives in New York. I'm all right in York. saying that Rochester's Compton. Uh, if, uh, I'm not really sure. I haven't had. I, I've been there plenty enough times. But... Because if, with comparisons, if New York is um, San Francisco, then surely Rochester, by the sound of it, small town, gang violence, it's got to be competent, it's right? A, it's actually a city. It's like a oh, small, it's, it's a smaller city. Um, that would be a big city over here. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's weird. I guess, I'm not really sure what you would compare it to. I, I guess you would compare it to like more like Philadelphia because it has the violence and the crime, but it's not, it's not like a shithole. Hmm. Um, like Detroit, Detroit is in a bad spot. It is not a good city, but it, it, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's RoboCup. Right. It's RoboCup right now. <laughs> it really is. It is not a good city. Um, and the only reason that like, I mean, they're struggling there. And obviously if you go there and you know more about the politics there, it's basically what happens when you have a city that is basically geared in the direction and has like 50 years of policy of just expand, 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 expand. And then all of a sudden that disappears overnight and the factories mm. just start closing and closing and closing. And then you have all these pipes, all these roads, all these houses with, with no one living in them, with no one being on those streets, with no one being anywhere, with all the industrial shit closing. So people just start leaving the city and it just creates an economic crisis. And mm. unfortunately the politicians that they've elected there, have been either corrupt or incompetent. And it has been, conservatives always say that it's been a democratic city forever, and that's true. But the thing is, is that like any Republican that you're going to uh, you know, elect in Detroit is just either going to be A, a corporatist, hmm. or a, a redneck idiot, who, in neither of which are going to solve any of the problems there. What this, what this, what this city needs is Ankepistan. That's what it needs. <laughs> it's not really that. It's basically, um, for either it would just be austerity measures. Oh, that like in this would, yeah. and it would just put a, a, a just of, uh, basically it would be, we're going to create, and I forget what they're called, but they're basically like these areas of land, and it actually happened in Buffalo not that long ago, mm. where. They ba the government will subsidize the construction of your business and you pay no taxes for 20 years. And, you know, they expect that to somehow turn over into prosperity and it never fucking does. Subsidizing, right? It's yeah. nationalizing, essentially. Not exactly. It's basically you as the government just giving a huge mm -hmm. handout to the corporations, expecting them. To and there is some logic behind it. But the thing is, is that if you start from the position of, well, I'm just going to let you fuck me in the ass a little bit. And it's like, okay, well, then they're going to say, you're like, well, how about instead I fuck you for a while? And it's like, okay, sure. And unfortunately, that's just, it also works in their favor because they're getting kickbacks. So would it, be fair, the would, it be, would it be fair to call this just the tip economics? I, I guess you can say that. I mean, it's just a new, in, in my opinion, it's just a new version of, of, uh, kickbacks for like it's like a new form of gangsterism um you see that a lot around here where the construction contractors and the uh the, like the architects and the politicians are all in bed with one another and basically what they do is they make sure that the guy they're in bed with wins the contract to then build this building on the taxpayer's expense and they get kickbacks and mm -hmm. it, it, it is like a form of gangsterism. And there's been a bunch of people in my immediate area, big, I mean, I'm talking like multi-millionaire rich cocksuckers living in, in the rich area of this area, which is called Orchard Park, mm -hmm. um, with multi-million dollar mansions living there. And basically for like the last 20 years, they've been just straight up gangsters, just making money off of the government's teat by rigging construction contracts. And then they go to jail. And it's been like that for, for like a decade. Uh, uh, or like Al Capone, essentially, right? No, they don't kill anybody. They just basically they just oh, control no, I mean, everything. That's how he that's how he lived though, didn't he? He, he did he did the similar lifestyle to them, then went to prison, died of syphilis. <laughs> right? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. He never got done for the gangster shit, just for tax evasion. No, they just, actually they, you'd be surprised in this area. They've been caught on like doing gangster shit. Like hmm. 
they they actually don't go to jail for anything like tax evasion or that. They actually get them. Like it's so funny. They've had they've had they've caught a bunch of people basically emailing each other and on phone calls they've recorded them and they've just <laughs> like they use gangster lingo. Like the one of the people that got caught and I could probably link you an article was oh, they were Sunday. referring to the amount of money that they were going to get in terms of thousands. So um, instead of saying one thousand, they say a box of ZD. So they oh said they said like it was like something like thirty nine or forty boxes of ZD. And boxes of ZD is actually a reference to The Sopranos. <laughs> oh my god! Po so it's take, great. You could take the hipster out of the middle class, but you can't take the hipster out of the middle. Yeah. Man, right? <laughs> <laughs> no matter how old they get, it's great. Not how rich they get as well. Actually, yeah. I know, and I can't judge. But when I was working, I saw some people who looked like they could have been hipsters because they dressed a bit like builders, but they weren't, or at least. Yeah, you, with... you'll you'll see that a lot. Like you'll, it, it's just the more impractical their outfits, the more likely they are to be a hipster. Yeah. Oh, like a uh, Trevor from GTA Five. <laughs> well, he's the actually he, he's he was the proto the the proto hipster. Yeah. Um, but it's <laughs> I love the line that like he's what everyone, <laughs> um, what every hipster aspires to be. But it's like, um, like I said, it's just the more impractical the outfit, like the more clunky the shoes, the more tight the, the jeans or with holes in them or like slits in them or whatever, the more baggy the top and just weird looking. You know, that's that's a hipster. Oh, God. I, or the fedora. They might have a fedora on their, on their head. So usually they wear like a like a straw trilby, I've noticed. That's usually what they wear. So like um, Buster Keaton. I, I'm not even oh, sure. I don't. I don't really follow. I don't follow very much. Like, oh, well, it wouldn't be a trilby. That would have been a pot pie. Where it's called. So, uh, speaking of uh, corporate, uh, fuck up. I actually forgot what the reference was. I was going to do a little segue then into Trump mm -hmm. and Syria, when we were talking yeah. about that stuff before. So, um, I did a video on it. You did a video. Well, you did a stream on it. Yeah. I, I did. I had less information at the time. I only gave my opinion on what happened. You know, I was in like, okay, this has happened. What do I think of it? And then the more I looked into it, the more I realized, like, there's no way, there's no way he made, well, first I knew he didn't make the right choice. And then next thing I know, I'm like, so what you're telling me is because, so, so the arguments is because he's seen children die and he felt bad about it. And he may have heard some things from the deep state, whatever that is. Which you, you'll probably explain that. It's something to do with CIA, FBI, and all yeah, that. Yeah, the, the deep state is essentially just um, like the, the government agencies that already exist, CIA, NSA, FBI, all the rest, um, with different variations of how corrupt they are. Mm. Um, the different... So the, eight, you go ahead. Yeah, so I was going to say, so they've been giving him potentially false information because they don't like him, maybe. Probably true. It, it, you're more likely to have those organizations feeding disinformation to the press than they are the president. If if yeah. you ever had like the NSA or another organization feeding the president bad information, I mean, that the, you would see a big reaction over that. You'd see mm -hmm. like it, it, there were things after 9/11, or actually not after 9/11, but after um, we invaded Iraq, you had tons and tons of resignations because mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, and like. So other people have said that he's gone against his his campaign promises, and I think that's yeah, absolutely. That's the, main, that's the main thing for me. I think it isn't to do with misinformation or he felt bad about seeing those. Maybe he did feel bad about the kids. I don't know what's in his head. But, right, um, and I'm not, let's say you know if we're being generous to him, you know maybe he did feel bad about the kids. But you know, I in all honesty, um, other than the sort of like real politics version of it, which is that you made a campaign promise you shouldn't do this because you're going to lose support, which he did. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the real problem with it is, is that you shouldn't be making very critical decisions based on mm -hmm. your feelings on the matter. It, because, it you know, I'm sure that Barack Obama felt a bunch of shit mm -hmm. and George W. Bush fe felt a bunch of shit. Mm -hmm. But you, you shouldn't be acting on that because, it was unfortunately, yeah, go ahead. It was a rash decision, and you wouldn't see Bismarck. Not yeah, Bismarck. You wouldn't see Bismarck doing that. Oh well, yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, it was a decision that was made, I believe, uh, either the next day or two days after the original <sighs> attack. You should have waited a week. The alleged attack, honestly, the alleged attack. I have still mm -hmm. not been. I have not been provided evidence to say that the gas attack even happened. I have not yeah, seen any evidence. The autopsies have all said that they had blemishes. That's not a gas attack. When you get gassed, it happens on the inside, not the outside. 
That was right. one of the things that um, V. I mean, Monroe maybe, talked yeah. about. Take v. Us. Monroe talked about that from the perspective of like the medical issues with what they were saying, because he said that uh, essentially with this gas, you should see internal bleeding and that these people should be coughing up tons of blood. And so you should see blood, but it should be around their mouths. But instead, with a lot of these dead bodies, they have like their heads caved in. They have all kinds of cuts and bruises and scratches and all this kind of shit. And it's like, well, like, how does this happen? How does how do all these bruises happen? How do all these gashes happen? Why is there no blood around their mouths? Why are the people lifting mm. them up two seconds after it happened? Why are they not wearing any kind of proper medical equipment to you know not die in the same gas? You know, it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense. Well, to play devil's advocate, there's many other types of chemical weapons other than gas, but and right, I can't think of any. I mean, I know there are stuff like maybe. Would you say napalm is a chemical weapon? Or is that just a kind of... Um, a, a fuel bomb um, would be a chemical weapon yeah, in fuel. part because it explodes. But the with, with napalm, as far as I know, that that's just kind of... Um, I, I'm not really sure what it would be classified as. But the thing is, is that this is one of the issues, right? Is that we can, we, we can do one of two things. We can sit here and say that a gas attack is immoral, unethical, and against the rules of war and against international law, and then follow international law. We can't mm -hmm. say that something is against international law, immoral, unethical, and then ta attack a sovereign nation, mm -hmm. which is against international law, unilaterally, without Congress. And that's what Trump did. Mm -hmm. Th this was an act of war. And what's funny about it is that I found out this later, they didn't even destroy the airport. It's in use no, right it, now. I found that. On, did you watch Mr. Medica about that? I saw that. I, I don't think I did, but I, I do. I, I did read it somewhere, and um, I can only begin to tell you that they spent something like I, I forget how many millions of dollars they spent. Ninety, it was tens, ninety million, tens, tens of millions of of dollars on this completely ineffective fucking attack for the purpose I mean, of. And, and it's funny too because I've actually debated this with a few people at this point, and one of the people I debated this with is Sargon, hmm. and Sargon actually defers more to the side of this being four dimensional chess, and it's like. <sighs> No. I don't agree. Like, I think this was a total fucking blunder because all he, all, the only people that are happy about this attack mm. are the neocons and the Hillary Clintonites. You know, those are the only people satisfied by this. Whereas, as far as I can tell, everyone else is looking at this. Even a whole base of mainstream conservatives look at this from the perspective of, well, what did we actually get out of this? Like, wh what was even the point? Like, they did yeah, a gas attack, but it's like, you know, every other day you got fucking North Korea dropping missiles in the mm. ocean, screaming about how they're going to nuke everybody. It's like, okay, and then why aren't we doing that? Like, that's it's a like, constant, you know, violation of international law. You know, why aren't we doing something about it? Okay, so he's, let's say for example, okay, so some people say 4D chess was essentially playing sides against each other, you know, manipulating being a Machiavellian. The, the, right? the, four, the 4D chess argument, to the best that I can actually explain it, is uh, we set a red line to say that there are no more gas attacks allowed in Syria by Assad specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. We assume that he did it, that there was a gas attack and that he did it and that this was a retaliation to that to show the rest of the world that we're not going to take any shit, that unlike Obama, if we draw a red line, we're going to follow it. That is the argument for 4D chess. And I still don't agree with it entirely because we didn't destroy the fucking air base. So hmm. what does that mean? Does that mean like next time? I mean, why don't we have fucking Trump out there on the aircraft carrier or the battleship or whatever we use, probably a battleship to fire those Tomahawk missiles. Why don't we have him out there fucking just with his cock in his hand, waving it on the ship? <laughs> if you're not going to destroy the intended fucking target, what is the point of launching hmm. those missiles? I mean, the funniest thing was that they were flying out planes the next day as if nothing had happened. <laughs> yes, yes. They, they were using the airbase the next fucking day. It's like... It, it, like, if the purpose was to remove his uh, ability to launch gas attacks, we were completely ineffective. And what was the other beautiful part of this? Um, so we, what about they may have killed other people, like kids? No, 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 no. Well, well, I don't know if that's true or not, but the, the thing that I found to be unbelievable is that here we had John Kerry out there just a couple years ago, if not even that, saying, oh, well, we're going to attack Syria unless they turn over all their chemical weapons. Russia swoops in and mm. seizes all their chemical weapons. So then the, the rational response to that, which begs the question, if Russia mm. took all the chemicals, how did they get any chemicals? Because Russia seized them. This, the, the same day that they, actually the next morning, 
You had Reuters spamming everywhere that they could. Oh, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they didn't give all the chemicals. Uh, uh, maybe the Russians worked with them, uh, you know, because there's no logical consistency. Where did they get the weapons if they were responsible for the gas attack? The only people that we know unequivocally had gas were the rebels. Hmm. So, it, unfortunately, there, there's so much to this. And it, it, who knows? Maybe he did do the gas attack. Maybe Bashar al-Assad did it. But the fact is, is that there is all this contradictory evidence surrounding this, saying that he didn't do it. There are evidence on the ground that shows that there wasn't even a gas attack, that this may have been just a plot, you know, conspiracy to draw us in. And mm -hmm. there's also, you know, the, the fact that even when we did attack, it was completely fucking ineffective. And it was a declaration of war. The unfortunate mm -hmm. part is so. if they would have basically declared war against us because we hit them, we'd we, we, we be fucking, we'd be putting ground troops in there today if they the declared war so. on us. What's interesting is, firstly, it could have just been the rebels doing what they, they do. Killing people. Well, they, they've been propagandizing nonstop ever since this whole thing started up. And the thing is, too, you have these fuck, this fucking group called the White Helmets, hmm. which if you look into them in any capacity, they appear to be a CIA front working with Al-Qaeda. So it, it's like, who the fuck knows what they're up to? Because the CIA, the, actually not the CIA, but uh, one of the representatives of the Obama administration was in like this press briefing, and he flat out admitted to saying that we actually sponsor them. We actually give money to them as an organization. And, and they don't actually disclose that anywhere. Didn't a few years ago, the rebels actually did use chemical weapons? They did use chemical weapons? There, weapons there's the, the allegation. Yeah. I haven't looked into it enough to, to say conclusively that they were responsible for it. But as far as I understand, I think in 2013, there was a gas attack. And there's evidence to say that it actually was the rebels and not the Assad government that was responsible for that gas attack. And be, because, like I said, like the, we do have involvement in Syria, and we were unequivocally backing the rebels at one point. But the problem is that, unfortunately, I think you had the Obama administration pulling back from that, while mm. you had the CIA still doing shit with the rebels. It's, I have it's, read. I've yeah. read that the SAS are down there, they're killing ISIS. I've heard. Well, I've heard about it's that. better than arming them because that's what we're doing. Hey. Hey, speaking of the SAS, they would, all you need is about a couple, like a small squad of them to go and destroy their air base. You could do it themselves. Yes. I'm not even joking. But the thing, but that's, that's the problem, though, because that becomes an international incident. Let's say that the Syrians shoot back. Then yeah. it becomes an international incident. Then you have every equivalent neocon in your country on television screaming at the top of their lungs that English or British citizens have died at the hands of the Syrians, and we need to go, 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 go. And then you have every American neocon on television saying, they just attacked our military ally, our closest ally. Go, 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 go. And you see, if you it was know, like a Falklands incident and Trump uh, responded, I could see that. That's the only thing I've ever agreed with Thatcher on, ever, was the Falklands. Like, damn right, you go down there and you protect British subjects, right? Because oh, we're not citizens, we're subjects, all of us. Right, right. You don't, you don't just first, well, even in the 70s, they were trying to flog him off, but the islanders said no. And then the junta was beginning to fall apart, so they thought, well, well, the good war will sort us out. And essentially, then, though, yeah. that's the difference, though. Like, yeah. uh, unfortunately, we're in this position now where you have the United States essentially responsible for mm. half the fucking espionage going on in this world. <laughs> and if they're not, you know, responsible for it, they're basically in part enabling it. Or we're allied with the people enabling it. I mean, the fact that you had the Saudi royal family funding the terrorists that were responsible for fucking 9-11, and we buried that information, and it still hasn't come out. It still has yet to come out officially that the royal family, the Saudi royal family, was funding the 9-11 terrorists. Because if your everyday citizen, your everyday baby boomer, had it in their head that Saudi Arabia was responsible for 9-11, then you have every fucking American overnight turning around and saying, okay, what is our actual relationship with Saudi Arabia? And that, I mean, that's the big thing in the United States is that we, we are so in bed with them that it is a caustic relationship. That we're, we're basically, and I mean this, you know, in all sincerity, we are their flunkies. We yeah. are their thugs. We just do whatever the, the fucking Saudis want or the, uh, the you know, uh, forget what the cutter, people in cutter would be called. Or, you uh, know, 
Yeah, the people in the United uh, Arab Emirates, you know, we, we just basically do do whatever the fuck they want us to do. And we fight their wars for them. And we back because the oil. fucking Wahhabists they got on the ground. Because oil, right? Isn't it? Well, it's oil, but it's also money. It's money. Mm -hmm. the, these people give enormous amounts of money to the politicians here in the United States. Um, you had all, all of the fucking different links with uh, the, uh, you know, the Clinton administration, uh, the Clinton Foundation. And, you know, the Saudi royal family. You had Bush in bed with the Saudi royal, royal family. I mean, unfortunately, these people are so invested in the United States that, you know, it's just, it, like I said, it's a caustic relationship. And I think that somewhere down the road, especially with our generation, with millennials, we're, we're so fucking red-pilled on these different people, these different entities overseas, that I don't, I don't think they have a future. I think eventually yeah. you are going to see a change in American policy. I reckon where you're yeah, over here, I reckon with my generation at least, we'll be seeing a lot less American British things because I think we're kind of sick and tired of always fighting with you in wars. <laughs> not well, they, I mean, that, and that's the thing. That was the thing that I was screaming about in that stream that I did, where I got really fucking mad be because honest, I do think a bit like that. I do, I do think. Why? Why should I go and if I join? Right, Army, right. Why should that's I go the thing. I mean, you? we, we, have, we have a we have a treaty. We have a military treaty, and the only mm. reason that treaty matters, other than being on paper, is your the willing the willingness of your citizens to die for our causes, mm. because that's what it's going to be. It's going to be us together going into the meat grinder for mm. corporatist reasons, for corporatist ends, for the reasons of the Saudis or the banks or wh whoever whoever wants us there for whatever reason. And we don't have the boogeyman of communism anymore, mm. where there was any kind of legitimate cause for us to fight a war. That doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. It's over with. It's just us fucking just shelling the, the desert. Mm. That's all we're doing at this point. We're just wasting we're ammunition into the desert. As they say, we're moving kebab. <laughs> well, and, and then, so the thing is, the reason why I got so mad mm. in that stream that I did was because mm. the, the more we do what we continue to do, including what Trump just did, the more we do that, the less credibility we have, the less our treaties mean, the less our standing means. And the fact is, is that eventually, if you see the rise of nationalist parties, nationalist politicians, you will see that the United States as a global power disintegrate very slowly. But and that's very what surely. I like about you. That's what I like about you. You get angry and you get passionate. And you don't give a fuck. Even when it's a script, you just go past. You just get passionate. You, right. It just comes out. I don't yeah. know how you do that because if I was a script I couldn't get angry. <laughs> I would just be reading it. Yeah, I, I the, mean, I, I don't oh, really know. I don't know really what it is about me because I can tell you that um, I remember when I was I, – I used to actually engage in a lot of debate, um, informal in the debate when I was in uh, college. Um, mm. And I can tell you that, like, that was one of the things that uh, many – like, I was actually recruited. In, I, I When I went to UB – uh, I had people try to do it, but when I left UB and went to Buff State, which is what my alma mater is, uh, I had people basically approach me and recruit me into the um, the uh, student congress there. So that I got I got yeah. basically recruited into the politics in that college because they heard me speak, hmm. and I was in a class. And basically, um, someone in that class who was a senator, a student senator, went to the president of the congress and basically said, like, you need to come recruit this fucking kid. Because, you know, he's crazy. So <laughs> so he basically, he called me into his office and it was pretty surreal because someone told me like he's going to do it so I should apply. So I did apply and he called me into his office and he basically said like, you know, I, I'm looking for somebody to replace me and I've been told that that's you. And it was pretty fucking crazy because I, I actually had a decent chance in my senior year to be the president of the student uh, student congress or student senate rather. I and, never um, bothered. I never bothered with that shit. It, yeah, I, I loved it. It was frustrating as shit because you had all these different mm. fucking internal politics going on, and there's always people just like the thing about politics is that it draws uh, idealists and it draws mm. really fucking like I, I guess the equivalent would be just um, power hungry sharks, people mm. that will say anything, do anything to just become in power, even if it's a student senate in a university they will say anything they will do anything to rise to the ranks and there oh, was God, one girl yeah. there was oh. some girl yeah go ahead no i'm just i think i know what this is i think this is a similar story to someone like in my gaming society there was a girl like that as well she didn't get to top job thankfully but um 
yeah, she wanted that top job because she was power hungry, but go on. Yeah, it's just like you have, it, it's not just about politics, but it's like, I think there's a lot of people out there and I know that I'm one of those kind of people that have like an innate sense of competitiveness. You know, mm-hmm. we, if, if there's something to be achieved that then we want it. And I think that it's what, it's just something you'll find in certain people that um, it, it's the sort of thing with entrepreneurship as well, that you just have certain people that uh, do not, like to be bossed they don't like the corporate environment and if they do like it it's only in the, under the circumstances that they're the ones giving the orders mm-hmm. and there are there are people like that that are, exist out there and with politics especially um what it, it draws in certain kind of people and like i said you have the people that just want it like a good example is mitt romney mm-hmm. mitt romney is not that guy mitt romney is a snob he's a rich kid what he wants is to take what he wanted when we're running the president. And this is my, you know, armchair uh, psychology here. But my position on Mitt Romney was I'm rich. I'm hyper successful. I'm hyper famous through my political connections. I'm now in politics. I'm going to become the president. And I'm going to take that title and just put it on my mantle. Hmm. You know, that's part of my legacy is Mitt Romney is winning the presidency. Whereas someone like Hillary Clinton, Hillary hmm. Clinton would be on every street corner sucking dick if it would make her president. She she doesn't give a shit. And that's why she was willing (laughs) and that's why she was willing to cheat so much during the election. Mm -hmm. Just so brazenly and without any concern. Because all she wants is to be president. Because that is the one thing she has not achieved and that is the one thing that she wants. So she's willing to do anything to get it. And the thing is I can recognize that. Mm -hmm. I know that feeling of seeing something like seeing some kind of prestigious organization that for anyone else on the street, they don't give a shit about, but you look at it as that's what I want. That's what I want to achieve. Mm -hmm. That's what gives me status. And that would, that's going to be something that fulfills me. And I think that a lot of people in politics have like this void in them that they want to fill. And they think that that title is what's going to fill it. That's my answer. So what I want to know is get away from (laughs) armchair psychology by Louis Laveau. Yeah, there you go. So, to ask you what what got you into the YouTube game? What made you decide? I'm Lewis, and I'm gonna I, go I've, with a play Asia. You know, I've actually um, it, it's just kind of I've always had like a, a creative side to me that I've always needed some kind of outlet. Like when I was um when I first got it when I was in high school, oh, I uh, oh yeah, did you lose me? Oh shit! I lost that. Yep. Yeah. Your batteries die. Sorry, not my uh, Bluetooth. Uh... <laughs> Are you back yet? Okay, shit. <laughs> I don't know if I should wait for you or just continue on with the story. Back yet or no? Still down? Well, I guess for the sake of the stream, I can continue on with my uh, story. Actually, I... I want to check the uh, the chat while I'm here because I haven't actually looked at that yet. Still down? <laughs> Technical difficulties. Ha <laughs> <laughs> He's going to run away and grab another headset. <laughs> I think his batteries died. Anyways, um, for the sake of the... Uh, <laughs> I told you, he's going to grab another headset. Apologies, mate. I can't hear shit. Sorry. Did you get another headset? No, he's still working on it. Anyways, um... Let's see here. <laughs> you got it set yet?
No, I'm just laughing because we're dealing with technical difficulties here, and that's what uh, makes it an issue. Anyways, I, I guess I can just continue on with what I was saying when he gets back. All right, you got your uh, your headset in? I don't know if he accidentally muted his own sound. Oh, man. Should I, uh, oh. <laughs> Hopefully this didn't, okay, we're still live. We're, we're still good. We're, we're about to fix this. Don't worry. All right, we good? Oh, no. <laughs> it might be over. The stream might be over. The technical difficulties. We've been shut down. It's over now. They've come in. They heard us speaking. Now it's over with. We, we are doing this live. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that's what's uh, the issue. Keep talking. All right, all right. Um, I kind of hear you. Cool. You kind of no, hear no. me? A little bit. Okay. Anyways. Um, I, I was just going to say that uh, uh, what was it? Oh yeah, it was about a uh, high school. That uh, with YouTube, the question was uh, with YouTube. The uh, the thing that brought me into YouTube was uh, just as a creative outlet for um, you know for me for something for me to do. Because when I was in a uh, high school, I was in the symphonic orchestra, and then out of high school and college, I, I got out of that and I started. I actually wrote a hell of a lot, and I actually have. A whole shitload of fiction on my hard drive that I wrote in my first three years of college, and then after my first three years, I uh, got into, I guess you could say, basically monologuing, which is pretty much what I do now, and uh, that's how it became a YouTube thing. And believe it or not, <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure I took down all these videos, but I used to actually do videos on YouTube with my face and my name, my actual name. And uh, I stopped doing that when I realized that, um, you know, that could destroy your fucking life. So then I rebranded and became Louis Laveau. And uh, then just started doing videos as an avatar with a pseudonym. Uh, so that's what got me into the YouTube racket. Oh, interesting. I could just about hear you. I'm going to keep doing All right. little things, trying to get it sorted out. <laughs> so, um... What about Gate? Was Gamergate the thing that changed it for you as well? But I thought, yeah. Uh, yeah well, I can, I can say that I had, I, I've had an interest in YouTube for a while, but I can say that with Gamergate, that was the thing that really, and you can definitely hear it in my older videos. You know, every fucking video that I did back then was just a video of me screaming, pretty much at the top of my lungs, and uh, you know that was really the cause of it because um, Gamergate for me was kind of just in the making for years. And to see it blow up as big as it did, I mean, that's it really inspired me to get involved <laughs> because, uh, you know, I'm sure that for a lot of people that was a big deal and it was important to continue to talk about it. Um, and, I mean, that was the thing uh, of all people that really got kickstarted by it. I, I mean, um, uh, Sargon of Akkad was really the person. You're good now? Yeah, good. Okay, so yeah, with 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 Gamergate, Sargon of Akkad was really like the uniting Same. force, I think, for a lot of people. And um, when I saw him doing his videos, I, I kind of said to myself, and I think I was already actually no, I had another YouTube channel, I think, or no, I was I wasn't doing YouTube. And then after I saw his videos, I said to myself, you know what, I should start doing this because you know uh, I think I can make some kind of uh, pitch to people that listen to me to be involved in this and I wanted people to speak to certain things that they weren't speaking to and uh, From there it kind of just it, you know br Branched off and it's one of the things that I I, I don't really talk uh, much about Gaming in large part anymore, mm -hmm. you know, I talk more about politics um, than anything now but uh, I can say that probably for the most of the people involved in this, that was where all of this stemmed was Gamergate because it was such a big deal. Um, 
And, uh, I, you know, the, the thing is still on. It really is still ongoing, but um, it kind of petered out a while back. I'd say it's dead myself. I think it's dead. Like, nobody's using the hashtag because apart from Travis right, Fox. right, right, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I mean, it as it, Gamergate, I would say, is over with. Like it is done and over with. Um, right around when actually uh, Sargon, mm. I think, was on a stream mm. or he did a video about it, and he said that like Gamergate is over with essentially, and a lot of people didn't like what he said. I think that actually right around that time mm. he kind of called it because I think it's just died. Pretty much right after he said that, and I thought because we didn't it, achieve it, everything. I thought we didn't achieve anything. He said we'd won, but we hadn't. Well, well, we we did in some small <laughs> part. We we had we we definitely struck a major blow to those outlets. But the problem with it is that, and this is my opinion on it, is that the real thing in the way of of what Gamergate for me meant, um, which was trying to reform gaming in the sense of, uh. It, it deals with the the industry itself, but it also dealt with the community in that it was basically to uh, make more gamers woke, for lack of a better phrase, about the industry as being this constantly this this force that was just looking to gouge and scrape and fuck every person, every consumer out of as much money as they could possibly get away with uh, for basically undercooked products. Hmm. And the fact that there are, there are still to this day very few consumer protections in gaming. You know, nowadays, especially on PC, um, you know, we're grateful for the ability to mm. refund games in only places like Steam. Like, it actually, when Origin launched, they actually had a very good return policy. That's kind of gone away. It's gone. They've, yeah, they kind of regressed in that way um, where you can't return shit on Origin now. I, I remember 10 years ago until... Was it one or two years ago? Steam didn't even have a refund policy. No, there unless, was there was absolutely no refunds, unless it was an Aliens Colonial Marines situation. Right, then and that was the thing. To... Like, and unfortunately, that was the thing with the industry was that it just it, it got so out of whack, and it got it just it, and that's what you saw. You had them, you had them doing on disk DLC. You had them doing microtransactions. Even now, and fucking, just fucking everything. Everything there's just micro microtransactions in now, and you had that just everything like that just and even now to this day just unbelievably deceptive advertisement. It's getting incredibly another thing, awful. Another thing, and I think this is me just being a bit conspiratorial, but another thing, especially with Metal Gear Solid Five and and Day Sex Mankind Divided, I am convinced they are taking whole sections of games out or just not finishing them. I'm putting them out there and releasing all the bits what, that they should have put in as DLC. Yes, That's what, what they're actually what they're actually doing is what you saw with Hitman, the new Hitman. Mm -hmm. They basically slated this game to come out at a certain time. The people developing it went to the publisher and said, "Listen, this is going to take us at least another year or two before we're even ready." And they said, "Well, you know what? The shareholders say you got to put it out this fucking year." So you're putting it out this fucking year, come hell or high water. So then they go, it's an episodic game. Yes. <laughs> you know, it comes in, you know, time segments and all that. And it's and it's actually funny because Hitman is a game, the new one, is. is not actually a bad game. And it doesn't have all the microtransaction bullshit and all the stuff you'd expect out of it. But they released it before it was ready with a single map, with a single, well, two maps with two missions, one of which being a tutorial and then then one mission. It's grown since then, and now there's a bunch of de content, some of which is pretty decent. Hmm. But um, I, I would say that most of what the things you're seeing now in terms of poor uh, choices by these developers, it is guided by shareholders or just poor uh, planning by publishers that are looking at, it, at everything from the position of a spreadsheet. Okay, we're down this quarter by X amount. We need a game right now to be put out. What's on the horizon? This game is about, they say they're about 45% done. Well, then they need to figure out how they're going to put it out in the next six months, whether they got to cut this or cut that or do whatever the fuck. Get it out. Next quarter, that's it. And then they, they put down that fucking, um, that line, and then they rush to that. And you see this with countless mm -hmm. games releasing that require massive day one patches. That's mm -hmm. a clear sign that something's being rushed out of development. And with Mass Effect Andromeda, absolutely it was rushed out. 
because they actually have changed the animations where they're actually much better allegedly now from what i've seen they're much better i mean it doesn't change the fact that it's a piece of shit but the animations are at least better but that's the thing microtransactions bullshit rushing it out the door day one dlc shit five years to make a game and that's rushed out I'm, yes, I'm, it I'm, was. It was, and that's the thing because they actually were doing it on the previous engine, and then switched it over to the Frostbite engine. Not that uh, you no. noticed, because it's it looks worse than fucking Dragon Age. You know, it doesn't look good. This the I I've seen people praise the visuals, games. but that's true. I, I mean, I'm not saying that they played shit, but the Dragon Age games never looked amazing, did they? No, well, it, to- unfortunately. The, the last the last Dragon Age, I would say, the, other than the character models, it did actually look good. There were vibrant areas in... There were actually very vibrant areas, of, you know, settings and maps within that game. The problem was just everything else that is, they... they no they hyperbole. Everyone. Is it really you, the, the worst game you've ever played? And you've yes. played Life is Strange. Yes. Wow. I, I've played I've played many games. Um, I used to, I used to hate with every fiber of my being Dragon Age Origins, mm. despite all of the glowing praise that still exists about that game. I used to hate that game um, pretty much more than any game that I've played. And I can say now that it, it's like a far cry, to, mm. not the game, but I mean it's a far cry from <laughs> where I was then. Um, that I cannot begin to tell you how much I hate Dragon Age Inquisition, not because. Like, I have some... Like, Mass Effect 3 for me is an easy game to hate because of all the, the controversy around it. Mm. But Dragon Age Inquisition is just a legitimately bad game that everyone... Like, it won a ton of awards, and people ascribe it to be a success despite the fact that a month out of release, it made shit and didn't sell any copies. But it, it's an un, it's an unbeatable game in the, in the way that it is so bad. And I've had people say to me that I'm wrong. Buy the game, play the game not finish it and tell me I was right in Skype and over, <laughs> over Twitter. I've had at least five or six people dead on say to me that I'm wrong, go play, and then later tell me I was right because I'm, they can't finish it. I'm refusing to give them money. I'm not giving them money. And Don't also, bother. I remember Pillars of Eternity with that whole kerfuffle with the poem. Do you remember that? Yes. Uh, that was a that was a uh, Kickstarter game, wasn't it? Yeah, with the uh, with the obsidian, and I, I've still not bought that game on principle. Yeah, I, I, I or not actually that was obsidian. What was I going to think of the the people that did um, uh oh shit, they just released the second game of it, or it's on early access. Uh, Rust? it's a what? Rust? No, 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 no. It, it's a it was it's an indie game. Um, hold on, let me. I'll, I'll launch fucking Steam and I'll look it up. I, I forget the name of it, but it was on Kickstarter, and I actually kickstarted the original version of it, and I, I, I hated it. I, it it's a top-down like RPG. I, I know now to not buy those just because I I can't get into them. Um. So like the original Fallout's not your thing. No, I don't. I don't think I could ever get into them. I, I know that it, it seems like I, I honestly question how many people actually like those games versus just saying they like those games i found I that did, to be a thing in gaming i did try i mean i like shadow um what's it called shadow bloody shadow run i love shadow run that was good mm. that's because it was turn-based kind of like final fantasy but a top-down rpg i like that that was good you'd, you'd like that one. Look all this shit up. but oh god it's like with, with I don't know if you ever played Deus Ex Mankind Divided, and you definitely played uh, MGS Five, but I um I played the last two Deus Ex. Yeah, so that's what I'm talking about. They, no way did Deus Ex Mankind Divided feel like it was a finished game. Like I was playing no, it, I didn't. and we were in the same country all the way through, apart from one other no two two maps. So you go to England at, at the end, you go to London. Then you go to, I think oh, you start okay. off in America somewhere. I might be wrong. I, uh, yeah, it, I, I, it's sorry to step it. back. Yeah, I know, I know. It, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's a decently polished game mm-hmm. in some aspects. The visuals are nice. You know, they have an interesting protagonist and interesting dy- dynamics to it, but it I didn't actually it. finish it. This. <laughs> yeah. I, and the, 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 developer, the developer seems okay too. Like, they seem pretty laid back. <laughs> I haven't really heard anything negative about them as a developer. Um, oh, squ- um, the- not Square Squeenix, is it? But um, I Dogs um, Montreal, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, they seem to be okay. Um, but I was going to say that the 
Yeah, the the company that I was thinking of was Laren Studios. All right. Oh, yeah. L A R I A N Studios, and they've developed, and the game was called Divinity Original Sin. Oh, yeah. So I kickstarted that back in 2014, and then it came out, and they actually made a game, and they they were basically they they the only thing they really done is have been the Divinity series. Hmm. Um, they 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 actually made a game called Divinity Dragon Commander. And it's basically like if you took a strategy game, like um, like a Command and Conquer game, and then introduced like uh, essentially like Dragon Age style politics into it. Um, it's actually not bad, and I think it's the best game that I've played by them. And it's kind of like this weird spin-off game that they made. Um, mm, I actually liked it a lot. Um, My favorite. You, have you played Command and Conquer? Well, you have, you you have played Command and Conquer. Yeah. You? What's your not favorite? everyone. Probably zero hour, but I've only played so many, you know. Tiberian Sun for me. I like I like the fact that you can actually see the protagonist. He's a guy. Right, right. Yeah, and that's that's where I think uh, a lot of that hero stuff came from, which you see in um the Warhammer game, the Warhammer forty Ks that came out or the Dawn of War games rather that came well, out that predates, heroes. That predates uh, Command, Command and Conquer by about ten, twenty years, I think. No 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 no. I'm saying that the recent it. the recent oh. Dawn of War games. That's I where actually, they introduced um, heroes. I'm, I'm really sick of silent protagonists, I'll be honest. I, I, I used to like yeah, them, but now it's just... That's actually... You and I might be alone in that. I've actually found that a lot of people prefer that over... Like, a lot of... I, from what I understand, a lot of fucking people hated the voice protagonist in Fallout. Hated it. He and I actually right. didn't mind it. He was all right. I mean, I preferred loads of different voices to choose from, but... Yeah, so would have I, but I, the thing I thought the problem was was that it, like one of the main complaints in it was that you couldn't really be a villain. They took that mm. away from you, and that's true. Not entirely, but it's it's largely true, and that's that was the um, Nuka World DLC, and that DLC was fucking amazing. And the thing is, is that I don't think anyone played it. <laughs> I don't see anyone talk about it, and I thought it was an amazing DLC, but I honestly think that Fallout 4, I honestly think, is one of those... Um, uh, um, it's one of those games where it, it's, in all honesty, in my opinion, it's popular to hate it because it's popular. That it has its say, see, like. Go, race officials gonna... disagree with you. He would, he would say, yeah, like, you know, spare me. You know, no, you know, the, the old games are all great. Oh, hmm. retro games. It's not just awesome. that. I think. He, I get he, it. He thinks that, that simplifying the games, and in many ways, it's true. But in many ways, Fallout Three had things that well. The due to technology that the old ones didn't have but the problem is for me it's it's that there is that oversimplification happening but at the same time he'll attack this is what i've noticed he'll attack uh mgs5 for being the phantom plot but then day sex mankind divided oh great exactly how it was meant to be even though it suffers from the same issues Right, and I, that's unfortunately, I think, of uh, just a mm. symptom of like fanboyism than any more than anything else. But you know, and unfortunately, I think it's just a matter of like one mm. of the reasons why I would defer more to streamlining is that you have actually seen games make improvements based on it. Mm. But it, in large part, it's not to do with just the combat; it's to do with um, the pacing of the game. I found oh, that yeah. the narrative, the the characters, everything is based more around a constant progression of the story than it is anything to do with anything else. Honestly, it was um, that's why, and that's why so many people like Mass Effect Two. That's mm -hmm. their favorite one, and I can tell you why. It's the pacing. Mm -hmm. The pacing of the game is the best in the series. It is it, if you play the game, and you'll mm -hmm. see this, especially with the DLCs. It's the same way. The story progresses from position to position. You are constantly on the move, doing something, and the story mm -hmm. progresses as you're doing it. And that's how you should actually, and that's how numerous movies are set up that are praised. It's it's the pacing, and that's what so many of these other games lack. And that's why, when it comes to the pacing, you couldn't name a single Dragon Age game to complement in that way, because See, none of them have good pacing. My thing is, it's kind of like Mass Effect One and Two. It's like Alien and Aliens. What's your favorite, right? And for me, it's number yeah. one in both cases. Go on, because with Alien, it's a horror. It's actually in my opinion, better made. It has yeah. more thought put into it. Because James yes. Cameron's just like, aliens, space marines, guns, yeah. All right. Right. <laughs> but with but with Mass Effect, it's the same. Mass Effect yes. 1, space exploration, new horizons. 
imminent ominous threat like there's lo yes. loads to do admittedly the planets aren't very well developed they're all just yes. essentially and, and the combat is terrible well, yeah but i liked it i didn't mind it yeah because I, it, I i didn't mind it either i mean it, it wasn't actually my uh, actually i think it was my introduction to bioware um but I can say that, you know, in, in terms of, like, the games that I actually think are my favorites, I would say that I'd actually put something, uh, not that I don't like Mass Effect, I do really like the original mm -hmm. Fast, Mass Effect, it's what made me a fan of the series when I was a fan. Um, I, I can say that there are other games, like, even though people name it all the time, uh, the first uh, uh, Knights, or, Knight, yeah, Knights of the Old Republic, that was mm -hmm. an excellent game. Um, I actually think it's better than the second one, which people seem to have this fetish for the second one. I thought the first one oh, was yeah, clearly better. Mm -hmm. um, not that there's anything wrong with Obsidian, but in any case, uh, you know, Jade Empire was another one. It was a one-off, and it was an, an incredible game. I thought it was great. And unfortunately, with Bioware, after, you know, basically after Mass Effect, it just dropped off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And they, it was amazing. I can still remember back to whatever it was, like 2010, I think, 2011, probably mm -hmm. 10, 2010, when Mass Effect 2 came out. I thought that It'll you know 2009, this is 2009 2009 2009 yeah. i thought that this was the the future of rpgs i thought like wow man bioware is going to be coming out mm -hmm. with uh, essentially the you know the, the um the equivalent of what they've been doing but with the pacing of something closer to like a call of duty game which you know, it, it's not it's not an equitable comparison because unfortunately now that most Call of Duty games are frowned upon, but there is a quick pacing to those games, and that's what they seem to do in the streamlining of the of the game. The thing that made me like insanely a uh, fanboy of of Bioware was the Lair of the Shadow Broker DLC, hmm. because I have I have yet to see a DLC in gaming that has matched that kind of pacing. It is some of the best pacing that I have ever seen in a video game where you are constantly moving you are never stopped you are never just sitting around talking doing whatever no you are moving from beginning to end of that dlc and then it, it feels like it feels like a fucking roller coaster ride and that's how pace that's how good pacing should feel that you're constantly progressing and on the flip side of that though yeah. uh, but i think it was good the citadel dlc number three was actually the best thing about three not because it's you know, pacing. I, I don't even. I think, development for me. I honestly think at that point mm. I was so angry mm. that I never even played it. I don't. Well, think I, I played, played it after. I played them about two to three years afterwards. Oh, okay. And believe me, despite not despite you know two to three years after that, I got the hate of number three. I got it because even with all the DLC, the endings were still shit. <laughs> well, the, the thing the, the thing about the endings to that game was the fact that. You, you basically had people already upset about the DLC situation, about the mm -hmm. microtransaction situation, about the multiplayer situation. You had people questioning the quality of the game itself, and I actually was l willing to look past it prior to the ending. But the thing that really, really upset me was the ending to the game and the choices that you got and the fact that it took away all choice and all matter. There was that. That very much upset me. The thing that devastated me as a fan and this is still true to this day was the fact that liara to sony who was one of my favorite characters of the entire franchise oh yeah, yeah uh had had a story arc that was built over not just the first and second game but you had books you had comics you had all of this uh tied into it and you had her storyline expanded tremendously where if you don't actually like if you look at the game by itself she looks like the the uh, you know a more than heroic character who's working in every way towards uh, Shepard's interest and is just all this lovable person. But if mm -hmm. you actually read the comics, you then begin to understand that like she's actually not as good as she pretends to be, and people don't really know this about her. Like it actually shows you a bit more about her character, mm -hmm. and that she's actually a bit more self-serving. And one of the things that I couldn't stand about the the third game was that. It like everything up until the end was building towards a climax that never happened. Like the entire foreshadowing of something that should have happened never fucking happened. The game just ended, and so you just look at it and it's like, okay, you you've been leading me on for three fucking games and you just blue balled me. What mm -hmm. the fuck is happening? 
and it contradicts have, itself yeah. it contradicts itself because you know like um with the geth and the quarians you can get them together or yeah one or the other i don't think yeah, you can yeah. just nuke them all and end it <laughs> right right <laughs> that, i would do that actually end them all it's like right but, but it never but that was like the tying of the knot you know what i mean that yeah. actually finished off the storyline with liara to sony there is no, oh, no completion. the ending contradicts it because you can get them together you know synthetics and Right, 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 right. And right, then the right. star kid says, "Oh no, they can't." And I'm like, "Well, mm -hmm. look, yeah, he's I mean, yeah, I mean, that's dude. The ending, the ending is just what it is. And and that's if yeah. you even believe that the that the, the, the kid was even telling the truth. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's kind of like, um, it, it, I honestly think that that the role of that kid was the equivalent of the architect from the second Matrix. That they wanted that kid to play that role. Mm -hmm. But it failed. It failed to actually be that role. It it didn't manage to work in that way. And unfortunately, because of that kid, and because of what he said, and because of that ending, there were so many. There were so many plot holes and contradictions because of that ending, that it riled up the fan base so fiercely that that's what started the backlash. And the thing that that really angered people so much. Beyond the ending, and it's what really, I mean, and it, 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 that hatred stuck with me for years, was the reaction by Bioware mm -hmm. and by the press. Who, yeah, that was just... <sighs> they you know, they oh, invented you know, two, two buzzwords that came out of that, two buzzwords, which was one, artistic integrity, and two was... Yeah, gamer gaming entitlement, and that's who Colin Mariotti is. Colin mm. Mariotti coined gamer entitlement. And Colin gaming entitlement Mariotti. Yeah, and and so they basically ran with that to destroy. Which it was probably somewhere around four or five, maybe six groups that were basically organizing for something to happen. And what I took away from it was that that the gaming industry needs to reform its practices, that they should not be releasing this kind of game. They should not be re releasing a game with day one DLC, rife with bullshit and contradictions and bad writing, with a completely abomination of an ending, and unfinished. Just an unfinished fucking game that they completely... Got. I mean, fucking Drew Carpatian walked away from it. <laughs> I should and tell you basically everything, man. Casey, Casey Hudson out up there just finishing it off. Hmm. With Mac uh, Walters, was it? Or Waters? Something like that, yeah. It was two different people. Anyway, I think uh, it's, it's, well, it's past midnight for me. So um, oh, Okay. I've got stuff to eat. I've not had my tea yet. And, um, <laughs> All right, we can wrap this up yeah. if you want to. Yeah, we'll wrap it up. Usually these don't last long anyway. So anyway, people, thank you for joining in. Uh, please don't, don't forget to subscribe to me and Louis Laveau and use his affiliate links. Give him that YouTube bow. <laughs> We YouTubers, we're suffering right now. Ad revenue is down 90%. And I don't know how long we've got. So uh, please, give a bro a dime. <laughs> anyway, um, see you later, guys. You going to say goodbye? <laughs> no, that's it. Fuck off. Fuck chat. Fuck off. Yeah, see you later, guys. <laughs>